Welcome to the fourth episode of Sal Mena's Not Yet Name Podcast. Yeah, it still doesn't have a name. This is not a gimmick. I just can't think of a name and not that creative to think of something cute. When it's all said and done, this will probably just end up being the Sal Mena Show or the Sal Mena Podcast. But it doesn't matter what the title is. What matters is that you guys are listening and as always, thanks for your continued support. Make sure you guys are subscribing on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher. Leave some nice comments. Leave some five-star reviews. And today you're also going to be listening to Joe Palacci, who is the bassist in True Love. It's a hardcore punk band. I told you. I promised you guys some quasi-celebrities. And here's our first quasi-celebrity. Um, talking a lot about getting into music, what his journey was, what it looked like, and just different bands and different uh, stories related to the scene and related to uh, his motivations for getting into it and what it takes to be in a band. Um, thank him for having me over. We're making up for an episode that we tried to record a couple weeks ago, but the host of this podcast is not that great. But Joe was a great guest, so I hope you guys enjoy what you hear. All right, let's do this. Joe, you look good. I, mean, I forgot to tell you when we did it last time. You, oh, really? You're looking, you're looking, looking, looking buff? Yeah, you're looking yeah, buff. Yeah, I've been lifting weights. Good for you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. What, um, I feel like I look fat, though. <laughs> no, it's good. But I was... We're all fat in the winter time. We have seven years. You heard me say <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I heard that a little, little bit. Um, <laughs> We're all fat in the winter time. We have 17 layers on. Well, you know, I mean, that was kind of my goal because I was so skinny before. And I didn't, I never even realized how skinny I was until mm-hmm. like I started looking at pictures of myself now that I'm bigger and I never, you know, in my, you know, in your head, you're always like some fucking strong dude cause you're a guy and you're an idiot. Right. But, uh, I've never confused myself for that, but go on. Okay. Well, maybe it's just me. <laughs> so, um, I didn't ever realized how skinny I was. And now that, uh, I've been lifting weights and eating differently than I used to, um, the differences are are very apparent when you started in music um you were obviously smaller getting bigger and putting on more muscle mass did that help did that hurt i don't know we haven't played very often um i don't think it'll make a difference no no if anything do you think you have more um longevity more stamina to, go? to play yeah uh i don't know we only play for 20 minutes at a time okay you know what i mean Right. So, so when you were little and you said you wanted to get into music, uh-huh. what was what what did that what did that whole decisioning look like? What was the major? Well, I didn't really, I wasn't really like too into music until I would say fifth grade, and then uh, I found like a little um, portable radio at my grandmother's house, and I brought it. I used to bring it to school, and I would listen to the radio um, during recess. Like eighty nine X would do like the top songs uh at lunchtime mm-hmm. around that time so it was when like dookie and smash came out and uh i was like fuck this shit is sick so i got like, i got those two records and uh i would just listen to them at home and then i wanted the radio so i could i could hear those songs at school and then they took the radio away from me and then uh they took the radio away from your school? They did, yeah. Those, How'd those, you get caught? Uh, they, we had like these new nades, like just some moms, mm-hmm. some some bitches stole my fucking radio. So, How dare they? Uh, I was pretty pissed about it. That's your it. shit. I was pretty pissed. Yeah, yeah. I would be. Yeah, they fifth send grade, letters fifth home grade, to mom. Fifth grade was a weird year for me. I didn't like my teacher. She was uh, not nice to me. She took your radio. No, she didn't. The new nades did, which what made me even more angry because you're just some volunteer mom. I'm like, fuck you. Um, but my fifth grade teacher was, was, uh, not a fan of me. So that made me antagonize her even more. And then I would, they would, they would take account of the lunches when you were buying lunch Mm -hmm. in the morning. They'd be like, how many people want pizza? And then you raise your hand, they count. And then they give you like a, like a red poker chip. And that way they know how many to make. How many don't you make? Right. So I would, I would just vote for whatever I wanted (laughs) But then I wouldn't get it. I'd get in the, in the different line. And all you had to do was um, make the noise because they were, like, too busy to make sure you put the, the chip in. So I would just, like, tap, <laughs> tap on tap the podium the, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I would tap on the little <laughs> thing, and they'd be like, okay. Or I would, like, break the chips. I, I would put them under my seat, and then I would sit on them and break them in half. 
Yeah, and two then, launches. Right. So then... <laughs> See, that's that's the ingenuity, I think, that is missing. Yeah, sure, it's bad. And yeah, sure, we're going to think of ways to scam the system, but screw it. Why not? Well, sometimes... Two lunches is two lunches. Sometimes I would throw them in my in my, in my desk because I had like, the, you know, we had those little cubbies mm-hmm. on the desk. Mm-hmm. And she went through my desk and she found all these poker chips I broke. <laughs> So she sent me to the office. She was like, you're, you know, she yelled at me or whatever. And then the principal yelled at me too. And he was like, your parents are going to be so disappointed in you and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, no. Cause, you know, because I'm 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I didn't, re- you know, I don't know that poker, like a box of poker chips is like five bucks or whatever. Like, who gives a shit? Like, it's not that big a deal. It's not your five bucks. Right. And, you know, he's like, your parents are going to have to pay for these chips. And I was like, oh, my God, no. <laughs> like, I didn't. Who gives a shit? Right. How much could they be? You know, obviously, like I need to be spoken to, but you don't need to like tell me it's the like I, I killed someone. Yeah, it's the worst thing ever that's happened. Yeah, at your elementary yeah, they were. School. Yeah, they made they made it seem like I like, you know, I fucked some kid up or something, and he can't walk anymore. But what if they ran out of chips and poor little Timmy didn't have his lunch? I go to school in Troy. I'm pretty sure there was you know there's money for for these poker chips. Come on, man. So that's like where like my rebellion started is like fifth grade. It's like I heard these records, and then I had this bitch teacher, and I was like, fuck everybody. And then that's that's basically how it started. You talked about Dookie and Smash, mm-hmm. um, which is which is punk, but it's not necessarily the, the, the hardcore punk that you're into now. No. Um, when did you find yourself shift into that, away from... Into hardcore? Yeah. So I was into like all that like kind of like radio punk for a really long time, and I got made fun of, made fun of for it in high school. Um, Why? Because there were really only, like, two, like, punk dudes in in the school. Otherwise, like, anyone who was, like, into punk was, like, a skater and, like, into drugs or, like, kind of cool mm-hmm. in a way, you mm-hmm. know? And I didn't really... That wasn't my vibe. So, uh, those two dudes made fun of me, but I ended up, like, befriending them eventually. And one of them taught me how to play guitar. And I was dating this girl at the time. And she went to Michigan State. Uh, and we dated for a while and then we broke up and, uh, I was at a party at this kid's house and I was just talking to somebody that I went to high school with and he had a girlfriend and she was like, why don't you just fucking move to East Lansing with all the rest of us and like have fun. And I was like, okay. So then I, uh, talked to my friend. He needed a roommate. I, I moved there. That's where the girl I was dating was living. And then, uh. I met a group of guys through a f- like a, f- a boyfriend of one of her like sweet mates, one of my ex girlfriend's sweet mates, and they were all into hardcore. I met them all over Halo Two, which was sick. Um, Is there any better way than over multiplayer? No, dude. It was it was like the cool days of like Halo Two. Like um, you could like swear at everybody and like it was it was like the wild west of the internet I, my username was douche with five o's <laughs> so these dudes were like on my level because they saw my name and they're like oh this guy rocks so they were like we're going to red lobster and i was like fuck i want to go to red lobster and they're like okay meet us at red lobster so i walked in and uh they were like are you douche and i was like i am and like that was it yeah. so i started being friends with them and they had a hard they had like a hardcore band and uh, I just kind of went from there. I ended up joining their band. It was called OK USA. Was that your first band? That was the first band I was ever in, yeah. So going back when you said those guys taught you how to play guitar in high school, was that the first instrument you played? That wasn't that wasn't high school. What happened was it was like late in high school okay. when I got a bass guitar. My dad had like the, this Vox guitar that he, he bought when he was a young guy. It was like a semi-hollow guitar. It was actually like a really cool guitar. I probably should have held on to it. But I traded it to this dude I knew who had some other kid's bass guitar. And I was like, bass is probably easier because there's only four strings and you only got to play one note. So uh, I traded the like the cool Vox guitar that I wish I had now mm-hmm. to this other dude. And he gave me this this other kid's bass. So I like taught myself how to play bass. With like tablature and like um, just listening to listening to it, like that's how I figured it out. It was always bass for you then, once you started playing. Yeah, it's just kind of I don't know. It's cool. Um, at the time, like 
nobody really played bass. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's really hard to find a bass player. So, does bass get a bad name? I mean, because it's not the lead guitar, it's not the loudest guitar. Uh, I don't give a fuck about that. I like, think it's sick. So that's that's why I, you know, I mean, I have a guitar. I like to play guitar, but I really enjoy playing bass. You you with your ear to the ground when you're listening to a song or listening to music, you can tell when there's no bass. Correct? Sure. Yeah. 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 The bass contributes what? Like, what do you feel like you contribute to the song? Um, I mean, I'm trying to make everybody, you know, quiver. Mm -hmm. You know, I want it to be loud. I want it to be thunderous. I want everyone to, to feel the music. It's, it's a very, um, kinetic thing. When you said just now there weren't a lot of people playing bass and you taught yourself, was there anyone that you looked at? Any bands that you looked at? Oh yeah, for sure. I was, I was, um, you know, really into Mark Hoppus at the time, Mike Durnt or whatever the fuck his name is from Green Day. That, he was sick. Um, this guy, Brian from the Bouncing Souls is someone I, uh, admired, tried to emulate. Um, Matt Freeman from Rancid. The standards, mm -hmm. the standards for sure. We, you and I come from, um, Italian, like pretty hardcore Italian backgrounds. Yes. And I can imagine, you know, as you started getting more into the music, getting more into the scene, uh, you were getting pushed back because you weren't going to college or you weren't going to follow a traditional job role or you weren't going to go work uh, construction or whatever. Mm -hmm. What did you hear and what pissed you off the most? Um, it wasn't so much like that. I think that, um, you know, I, I didn't really get that much pushback from, from my family. They're mostly concerned with how I looked, you know, is uh, what would irk them, I think. You know, I had like a really huge mohawk. I looked like a fucking dumbass most of the time so they were uh they were pretty concerned about that but you know the tattoos didn't help uh i didn't i didn't get tattooed until i was like 19 and then i didn't really have any visible tattoos mm -hmm. um then and uh i made an agreement with my sister she's like you need you should stop getting tattoos until you're a little bit older and i was like okay so i stopped until i was like 22 and you haven't stopped uh no, no. <laughs> so I'm curious about the tattoos because you were you 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 mentioned before that you've got a bunch of uh, you've got some pieces that they all mean something to you, and when you would explain that to um, your family, what was their reaction like when you'd show them like yo this one's for you? Uh, I wouldn't say that they were very impressed. You know they don't really uh, care for uh, the way that I look. I would say you know I don't I don't know that it makes them excited, but. Um, but it's an expression. I don't see... Again, it's not my bag. I don't have any. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is what it is. But if it's what you want to do, I, I, I guess I... Looking at it from a parent standpoint, I would be concerned because there's the stereotype of, oh my God, who are you hanging out with? What are you doing? I wish that stereotype was still around. I'm not sure that that stereotype's still around. Well, it's so, you know? it is super mainstream now. It is. I put, you know, I put a lot of money and effort into looking... Um, unwelcoming <laughs> and now everybody has them so everyone's like oh tell me about your fucking ink I'm like dude I don't want to tell you about it that's not you know I've said this to you before they're not they're not a welcome mat they're a stop sign mm -hmm. I want you to leave me alone that's why like I that's why I did this and also because I want you know I want to look like my tribe I want to look like some punk rocker you know what I mean that's that's how I want to look like so the tattoo started to evolve you got into your first couple bands um, the name of the band again? So that band I joined was originally called OK USA, uh -huh. and it was kind of like a uh, you might like this. It's like a Republican kind of band. They were all Christians, but they were all totally like these, fits you. They were all well, they were all these like skater guys, and uh, but they all love Jesus. It's a weird time in, in hardcore. So uh, I made friends with them because they they were all pretty crazy. But they went to church on Sunday. And then um, one of them had to quit the band for some reason. I think he joined the Marines and he played bass. So then I joined the band after they recorded their demo. And they changed the name to Thrashing in the Streets, Tits. Yep. Yeah. And this was like the most fun I ever had in my life up until that point. It was incredible. We always hung out. You know, they had their own um, house uh, in like inner city Lansing. And we used to like play curveball and um you know shoot fireworks at each other and shit it was it was pretty crazy the stuff you should be doing yeah it was yeah. cool it was very cool yeah and that's not welcoming so the tattoos the fireworks yeah 
You're probably doing a good job of not welcoming people. I mean, other people, yeah. But as far like I said, like my tribe, we were it's we good. were down with each other. Good. So then uh, that's like how I started meeting people through like playing shows and stuff like that, and started playing bass in other bands and making other friends that looked like me. How long were you in that band? Oh, um, I don't know, maybe four years, something like that. Maybe I was 25 the last time we played. I don't know. Oh, well, wow. So every now and then you guys will get back together and play. Oh, no, we won't do no. that. Oh, no, okay. Right. No. So you've had multiple groups and multiple bands that you've been together with. What's What makes you decide or what makes a band decide you know, hey, this isn't for us anymore. We just, it just kind of ran its course, you know, that that was just like a band for fun, you know what I mean? It was just, we mostly played like house parties and stuff that I would throw. And, um, you know, there'd be like a hundred people at my house and we would play. And then, and then like everybody would destroy my house and then they would leave. What, how would you, how would you market that? What would you, how would you get the word around? This was before? This is like right when like MySpace was, okay. was like popping, dude. And so we were like, uh, the guy who sang in the band was like really into MySpace and like he would like handle all that. Like this was like the early days of the internet and shit. So he had a handle, he had his, he had his ear to the ground on what the... I don't know if he had his ear to the ground so much as that he didn't have a job <laughs> at the time. He had the time yeah. to yeah, sure. look at ways to make it big. Sure. So the band, you guys stopped playing and it just moved into a different direction. You wanted to go other directions? or I, was, I joined another band from there and then I also joined another band from there. Um, and I just kind of kept going and like they didn't. Because I'm always curious about that when, when bands split, when bands go on hiatus or, you know, when they come back together after so long um, and they always say, well, there's creative differences. Well, I, I can't imagine that creative differences would be a block. I, I, I would think that if you have multiple opinions of a direction or multiple opinions of a way you want to go, that would help. That would help the get the creative you, that no. you're looking at, at a band as though it's a rational thing you're, you're looking at it as, as like a, a normal person would no one who is in a band is a normal person you know you just all are kind of fucking stupid and uh you just there's a lot of egos to navigate when you're in a band you know what i mean and uh you just got to find the right balance and then when you're off balance is usually when you should call it a day. Mm -hmm. What's what that I mean? right balance? What's a good chemistry in a band? Do you need different personalities well, I, to bounce I off think, each other? Or? I think that there needs to be like a leader. You know what I mean? Um, I think everyone, and this is just how I look at bands, I think everyone should understand what their role is and just stick to that. You know what I mean? I think that's that's the best way for a band to function. Someone who like comes up with the songs like uh, like the bare bones of the songs and then like you present it to the band and then like if uh, that's part of this person's process then you know you all come up with ideas like bounce bounce off each other or something like that or there could be two guys who write the music and then they say this is the music shut the fuck up play it like this and like that's you know you got to figure that out so is there compromise i mean do you, sure. do you have you ever gone found yourself where you have said, okay, fuck it. We'll do it your way. I don't really agree with it, but we'll fucking do it. Sure, that happens a lot, all the time. Yeah. And that's where I ask where isn't that more beneficial because maybe as you do perform and you do do it the way um, you didn't think, maybe you would find it. Oh, or when you're performing it and then the guy that wanted it his way hears it and says, you know what, Joe, maybe you're right. Sure, I mean, that's, that, I'm, that's, that's definitely happened. So uh, um, it, it just depends on, on the situation. It depends on the piece. It depends on, on, I mean, even merchandise. You know what I mean? Like, Mer You bring up merchandise. I wanted to get to that, too. It's a big deal for bands you, like you guys. Sure. Uh -huh. how, how big of a deal is that? Uh, I'd say it's pretty important, um, especially for like a band like, like the size of my band. Um, you know, it's, it's a big... Um, I don't want to say money maker for us, but it's something that like sustains us. You mm -hmm. know, like we need gas money to get to the next show, and like that's that's how we get money to play the next show is by selling T-shirts. So it we have to have like stuff people would like to buy. What's the thought process on that? Where I mean, you you go to different shows and you see just the 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 
the t-shirts are there, the hats are there. Yeah. You know, the the seat, the albums are there as well. Have you, what is what are some other items you guys have done or have you seen where you're just like, oh, that'd be a good idea, or oh, what the fuck are they thinking trying to sell that? I mean, I think everybody just kind of looks at what everybody else is making and they just make that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They, you got to um, pay attention to what the kids are buying. And uh, if you can afford it, make those. Or if you don't give a shit, then you just make whatever you want. Make whatever you want. Yeah. What um, What's the coolest piece of merch you've ever, guys have ever had? Like, that we've ever made? That you think is like, wow, that's, you know, we should do more of that, or I wish we would have sold more of that. I thought it would have been cooler. Um, I don't know that um, anything we... Uh, we I don't know. I don't really know. I, I like all our merch, you mm-hmm. know. I like all of it. I, I have almost every piece of merch that we've ever made. Nothing really sticks out to me. I mean, we made these cool hats. It took a long time to make these fucking hats. But, so, in in your guys' shows, obviously, the, the stage diving and moshing and things like that. Very if sick. I'm buying a hat, yeah, I'm probably going to lose it. I don't care. I mean, I know you don't care, but... Uh-huh. So, do you think about that? Well, it actually benefits you because you'll sell too. I mean that that's not my goal. If you lose your hat, then you know you're you're, you're a dumbass. What do, you want, what do you want me to do? Buy the hat after the show. Buy the hat after the show. That's yeah, kind of what I was going to would do. Yeah, it's not my fucking problem. Gear it towards after the words. Yeah. Kindler, gentler, thinking of our fans type of way. You know what, man? I, I'm kind of over the kindler, gentler <laughs> thinking. So you la- so you got out of the one band, and you went to a couple other bands. You said you went to another band, and uh-huh. you went to a band after that. I went to. A band called Fade Away Jumper that uh, was pretty stupid, but it had a couple cool guys in it that I liked. What's the story on that name? I don't, d- dude. I was not, you know. We're in March. It's relevant right now. I didn't like name this band. I just joined this band because I liked the people that were in the band, and then it got fucking weird, and then we stopped being a band. That that's that's the story of that band. And but I wouldn't have been able to join Fight It Out if. I wasn't in that band, Mm -hmm. so that was cool. I really like Fight It Out because those guys are all really fun. You have the shows, you have the shows, you have people coming to the shows, and you, you know, you're selling your merch. And obviously, as MySpace becomes Facebook, becomes you know, blogs becomes these different ways to be discovered. Yeah. Where, where did you guys get discovered? I guess where you were eventually invited to get studio time or talk to a label or... we well we pay for all our own studio time so far except for true love true mm-hmm. love um on the lp it's current band yeah we didn't we didn't pay for the studio time or anything like that that was that was the first band that anyone has ever invested money in otherwise we paid for everything ourselves did you tour with um fight it out yeah we did like weekends and shit that was like the Definitely the most fun band I've ever been in, just because everybody was like really um, friendly and you know we really really like like each other. You know what I mean? Um, we enjoy we're, we're really good friends, and that's like the best part of being in a band is is the the camaraderie of it. It's not so much playing to shows; it's more so like um, making memories with your friends. You know what I mean? The rewarding part is like people who like your music, you know, like creating art is is really fucking cool. That's one of the the coolest parts of being in the band. But like going someplace that you wouldn't normally go with your friends is definitely like the best part of being in a band, for sure, 100%. When you started touring, and I know you had mentioned that they're not huge tours and they're not huge shows. What did that do to you in in after your first tour or after your first show in a different city out of Michigan? What did that do to you in your outlook? Like, what were you thinking of that? I point? was like, this is the best fucking shit I've ever done in my life. Like, even if there's only like 15 kids at this show in a VFW hall or somebody's basement, like, it was so much fun. Um, you know, we'd, we'd either like sleep in the van or like, you know, um, somebody would put us up. Jer- Jeremy would say, uh, we need a place to stay. Look it up. Or like, we knew someone you know, or whoever, like, booked the show would put us up, and then we'd, like, stay up all night just, like, making fun of each other or, like, you know. It was just a bunch of dudes hanging out. Yeah. which And, and doing stuff that you love to do. Yeah, like prank calls and, you know, going to fucking Waffle House or something like that, you know. Yeah, I mean. Creating games in, in, in the van, you and know. And I, I think that translates, too, because, you know, I'm not I'm not in a band. I'm not in, um, you know, art 
you know, like you're into art. But I've played basketball, I've played football, I've played, you know, with, with, with a bunch of dudes that we've hung out or we've gone to different tournaments and stuff in. It's, again, I can absolutely feel what you're saying is, you know, just driving out to these tournaments or driving home from these tournaments or, you know, going, uh, you know, to these hotels when you're, you know, holy shit, we advanced. Do you believe it? A couple of white dudes and we're in a quarterfinal in Chicago. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and yeah, I mean, it's definitely fun. You, you don't expect, you know, to make anything, you know, no NBA scouts are calling anybody you know, we're already in our early, early 20s, and we're not getting called, but it's fun. It's sure. just, it's fun as hell to be able to do that. Right, and the, and the band is just our device to spend time with each other, mm-hmm. basically, you know, as far as, like, Five Out is concerned, and that's why it was so much fun. Yeah, um, so that it, it, with all the fun, with with you guys that started to um, tour, any recording with them, too, or you, you paid for some recording? No, uh, Adam, the drummer from Fight It Out, would do everything himself. He's, like, this... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's like a virtuoso. He's very, he's very, very talented. He can play all the instruments. He can play drums, uh, guitar, bass. He does everything by himself. He would, he would write the music in his head and then play drums on his teeth, and then remember it. Yeah, and then um, he would go home. And his dad was really into music, and so he had all this recording stuff. It wasn't like the best stuff in the world, but it was like really, it was adequate and it was, it was cool for what we needed it to be. And so Adam would record everything himself and then, like, teach me the songs, and then I would do, like, the bass. And then uh, Jeremy would sing, and that'd be, it. It'd be like, just the three of us on, on the record. Between, like, girlfriends and work and wives and dogs and goldfish and, sure. and everything else, how hard would it be to get all you guys together? I mean, it sounds like you'd record your part, he'd record his part, he'd record his part. Is it better when you're all together, or is it almost better where you're not distracted by anything else. I mean, I like it when everything just kind of comes to me, which is cool for me. Um, but, uh, I mean, I'll do it any way that everyone is comfortable, you know? Like, Adam Adam just does everything by himself. We played a show recently, like, Fight It Out, played a show after, like, four years of, like, a hiatus or whatever. And we were like, man, this is really fun. Like, Adam, like, write five songs and, like, we'll do, like, an EP or something. And then uh, we were gone for like a month or something, like we didn't see each other. And then I uh, went up to Bay City for a, a party for uh, a friend of mine who's in the band. And uh, Adam showed up with five, five songs, songs. On, on, a, on, a, on a CD, and they were pretty sick. That's great. So, yeah. Where are the major scenes? I mean, you, you just said Bay City um, in Michigan. That's not a major scene. That's well, just... <laughs> you were just up there. That's just where they live. Okay. So in, in Michigan, obviously the the genre of music, I I'm I'm blind to it. Uh-huh. I listen to you guys. Uh huh. I don't know anyone else. Sure. Um where do you go where you have the biggest crowds or the biggest following or the most educated following in Michigan or, you know, wherever? Uh I would say here is where everything happens in you know, in Detroit. Um I mean obviously like I'm sure some if someone is listening to this and they're in Grand Rapids or like, what the fuck, fuck this guy. But like, you know, um, this is always where it's been like the spot as far as like hardcore is concerned. Otherwise it's just like anything else, the coast, mm-hmm. you know, um, Richmond is, is pretty, pretty banging right now. Virginia. Yeah. Um, we're going to go play like a, a festival there pretty soon. And like the Jersey shore is like some shit right now. Doesn't strike me. No. I mean, Virginia, I, that's why I kind of said that out loud, but Virginia wouldn't have uh, struck me again. D.C. is is, is pretty, pretty hype right now for hardcore, too. Well, I think D.C. is very diverse in everything. I think it's very funny that yeah. they have a um, they have a big rap scene, too. They have um, a big scene in everything. There's a lot of, there's a lot of different people yeah. there. That's why it's well, cool. It, it, it's one of those towns where nobody f- that lives there is from there, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of those towns... Um, on the coast, probably, mm-hmm. and maybe that explains the Virginia scene right now, mm-hmm. which is great. I mean, that's great because you can't be married to, you know. Unfortunately, when you you know think of Nashville, you think of country music, or when you think of um, Atlanta, you're thinking of rap music right now, and um, it, it's it's better to have those options because you know someone from someone like you, where you grew up in Detroit, and you started coming into your own at the time when Kid Rock was doing his thing or, right. you know, we obviously are Motown. So um, for you to have discovered the music that you really, really like, mm-hmm. it's, I think it's just beneficial to everybody, not only 
for you, but anybody looking to get into something different than what, you know, I'm from Chicago, I need to be into the jazz or the blues, and um, it's better that way. Sure. I think everybody has to go through their own journey to find what they love, you know what I mean? Your your journey, um, you brought up, I, I want to hear the hipster, uh, the uh, the greaser story again. Oh, like how, I, how <laughs> I, I wanted everything to be grease? Yep. I really did, dude. I wanted to be a fucking T-bird really bad. And I thought high school was going to be like, everybody would be in their own like category. And uh, um, I got there and everybody was just a fucking douchebag. And it just kind of ruined it for me. made me not want to be there at all. I didn't want to be there, period. But then like I got there and everybody was just like copy of each other, just some clones like... So there were no groups really. like you thought, like the jocks, there was the, preps, like, the this, the that, the nerds, there the were, whatever. There were like a few here and there, but like it wasn't really, nobody was like sectioned off or anything like that. There was like cool guys and like, and like they're like girls. And then like there was like my squad, which was like the B squad as far as like cool people are concerned. And uh, we didn't have any girls. So touring, mm-hmm. you've been, you've been all over Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> You've been to the Midwest. When you guys are approached by a festival or approached by a venue or whatever, mm-hmm. how do you decide? Let's do it. Let's not do it. Uh, if it's cool, we'll do it. If it's shitty, we won't. That's that's how we decide. And the scene probably makes a big deal. Like if, if you said you're going to Virginia, mm-hmm. it's a good scene. You guys are going to go. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. But if it's uh, West Bloomfield or Traverse no. City or... Uh, you know what? There actually used to be like a small little hardcore scene up in Traverse City, like maybe 10 years ago or some shit like that. Uh, just cause like this, this girl was doing, um, she was like promoting there. She, she brought a bunch of bands up there and stuff. So when you decide to go, what does it take to go? Money. Yeah. Merch sales. Um, I mean, we definitely, uh, need like a guarantee to to play from you the know promoter, what I mean? yeah, oh yeah, but it's, I I wouldn't say that it, that it's exorbitant or anything like that. It's not like, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you how much we get paid, but sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. It has to be sustained. I mean, you are paying for gas and yeah, you know, we and... we don't own a van, mm-hmm. you know, because we don't tour often, so we have to rent a van. You know what I mean? And we're all like old, not as old as me, obviously, everybody. But um, you're the oldest one. I am. By how much? Uh, uh, six years. No kidding. The youngest. Yeah, he's twenty six. Wow. Yeah. It's a big spread. Yeah. So how do you how do you bridge that gap? I mean, you're he's twenty six. You're thirty two. How do you bridge that gap? How do you how do you? Find I've been in the band guy? with him since he was twenty. Okay, so he's just been around. Yeah, he's just he's just my homie. So who is it? Typically, a promoter that'll reach out to you, or do you guys solicit? Like, hey, we'd love to play your show. Uh, they generally ask us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the best place you've been to play. Yeah, best oh. tour. Well, best place to play. Um, and what makes it the best place? I I mean I like playing at home, always. Um, Are you pandering? I'm not. <laughs> okay. I'm really not. Good. I like playing at home. I can go home and fucking go to sleep. What's up? No van. Yeah, it's great. Um, the best tour we ever did, I would say, uh, is probably. Oh, I don't know. Uh, the Turnstile tour was pretty cool because we were we were with Freedom. That was cool. And Turnstile is always incredible to see every night. So that was really cool. It was like a two-week tour. Uh, they had a record called Nonstop Feeling that was like their first um, like headlining tour. So we did like uh, the East Coast leg of it. It was pretty cool. It was, it was really, really fun. Everybody was together. It was cool. When when you go on a tour like that, that you're, they were touring their album and you were with them, or any of these festivals, what are some of the biggest crowds you've played in front of? Uh, I mean, this is hardcore. Is probably is, is the biggest um, that's crowd in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's, that's like the that's like the hardcore fest to play. It, it's it's like a four day. It's almost like Warp Tour at this point. It's like a big four day festival, and there's like it's only in one spot. Well, I guess it's in two spots, but um, there's like food carts, and there was like a barber there um, one time. Joe had the Renaissance Festival people. Oh, like that okay. shit. Yeah, he he's like big into that um into that scene. So he had like these knights like fighting each other and shit at the fest. It was pretty cool. It's all right. Well, again, I mean there's something for everybody. 
And yeah. you know, obviously, the, it's a little, it's a little, uh, it's out there for a hardcore festival. But you know, he's trying to he throw spaghetti he's, on he's, the wall, see what sticks. Well, he's making it his own. You know, he's into that shit, mm-hmm. and you know, he wants everybody to see like a bunch of dudes bas- bashing each other with swords. And people shit. dig the fest, the gathering of juggalos. I think a renaissance. And this, fest. Is, this is a little different than that. Yeah, come well, on, give, give me a little credit. Well, I'm saying at the at the gathering of juggalos, you probably see everything. I don't and people, need to see people any of that. Are not, I don't want to see any of that. I don't see any of it either. But it's not for everyone. Sure. Yeah, he wants to try a Renaissance Fair. Sure. I mean, it's just it would just be like makes it his own. These two dudes are gonna fight at this time. Come, come, take a picture of it. Did they get fucked up? I don't know. You didn't watch? No. <laughs> I'm not. I, I'm, no. I have time for that. Did you eat the big ass chicken leg? Uh, they didn't have that there. Oh, well, it that's where just, you screwed it up. Well, you know, there's a bunch of vegans there. I don't want to get into it. I have a big ass celery stalk. All right. What? Okay. These big crowds at these big festivals, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I watch your videos on YouTube, and you guys, people just got openly running on stage, and yeah. it doesn't infect you or anything. What, what goes through your head if 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 someone when you when the first time you saw someone jump up on stage, what went through your head? During a, like a true love during set? a show or any any the first time the first time I saw people like doing it, it became like a phenomenon recently, and. Um, at first, I was like, fuck these kids, like, you know, it's not, they're they're kind of making it about themselves because they want to see themselves mm-hmm. on these videos on the internet, and then they started, they did it for us, and I was like, this is fucking sick, so, you know, it's it's all about perspective and point of view, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I love it, I, I think it's cool. Your fan base for True Love or uh-huh. your other bands, where, where have you heard people... Where's the farthest someone has reached out to you and said, yo, I really dig you guys? Oh, yeah, like from like Indonesia and stuff. And, and um, you know, they'll like email the band and be like, oh, please sell me this T-shirt that you posted. Because we have like a big cartel and I run it. And um, I'm just not going to do that. You know what I mean? I only, I only ship to the continental United States. I'm not going to figure out how much it's going to cost for me to send you this $12 t-shirt when it's probably going to be like $25 mm-hmm. and like not worth it for you to buy the shirt. And it's not, I'm not going to go out of my way for that. I got a fucking mortgage to pay. I don't have time for this shit. But do they reach out to you because they listen to the music or because yeah, they yeah, think yeah. the shirt's it's sweet? Not that or... I don't appreciate that they like the band, but I'm just not going to, like it doesn't make sense. Like you should just get a Sharpie and a t-shirt and write true love on it. You know what I mean? No one else will know. In your country. Right. No one, no one, you know, and like the record label, now that we're on Bridge Nine, they hand, they do, they ship internationally. They print uh, merch with our logo on it. You know what I mean? And they handle that now. I'm sure. I hope that whoever wanted a True Love t-shirt from me that never got it, um, I hope they got it from them. What does that look like when, you, when you're signed to a label and control of the recording or music or touring or or even merchandise rights well they can't tell us to tour but uh i mean it's all you know it just depends on what you work out with them you know what i mean um they they can print our merch and sell it you know we can do our own thing too and the percentages are negotiated i'm sure that sucks Something like that. Do you like having control of it on your own, or is it nice to have a broker to just be like, yo, this is what we want to do? Um, I mean, I, I uh, wanted to be on, on Bridge Nine, you know. Um, that label put out a bunch of cool records in the early 2000s that really had an impact on all of us in the band. So it was, uh, it's kind of like a badge of honor or something like that, you know, to, to say that we had a, a record come out on Bridge Nine, you know what I mean? I'm proud of that. Did you ever get to the point you know, after touring or with the label where you're like, I'm going to rule the fucking world one day. No, no, no. no, Did you ever aspire for that? No, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to be rich off the band or anything like that. It's like, it's, it's an art project I do with my friends. You know, that's not the point of this band. Um, you know, we just want to make an impact in our small little niche and like stay there. You know, we don't, that's not really like our, that's not our vibe. That's not the point of the band. You know what I mean? Would that ever change? With True Love? No. No? No. Not, not as far as I'm concerned. You know, I mean, there, like I said, there are other um, egos and idiots in the band. And we're all idiots. So, you know, we Does all Does it take to... a special kind of idiot to stay in a band? And <sighs> Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. You got, you got to, you got to, you have to be able to put up with your friends. You know what I mean? You got to, you got to navigate each other. 
you know, and it's a give and take and it just depends on how much you love them. So the logistics of it, when you guys get, you know, when you guys get older and, you know, life changes and life happens, marriages and engagements and Mm -hmm. homes and moving. And uh, you had a friend that was in the military who now he lives in California. Yeah. That's got to be hard. I mean, that, that's why you mentioned you probably haven't played in a little bit longer than you would have liked to. Sure. Or? I mean, he went through, you know, a life change um, completely. Uh, I'm getting married. You know, we're all... Uh, Mike just got engaged. He just joined the band and now he's engaged. Oh, nice. So, um, you know, we're all at different points in our lives and we just, you know, um, have to make time for it if we want to make time for it. And we all want to make time for it. So someone starting out, you know, obviously it, you, you you can tell that you have an adoration for the band that you're in right now. Yeah, I, I love it. I um, love this band. For someone starting out, what would you tell them the most important part of, you know, in, in joining a band is? Is that is it more stay with your friends and fuck with your friends? and? It, I, I would say that it um, it takes, learn what it what it takes to be in a band first before you are too committed to any one idea as far as art is concerned because your friendships are more important than what you will create you know what i mean Mm -hmm. because friendships are lasting like you know our music is on is on vinyl but you know eventually like not very many people will listen to it you know what i mean maybe right so, you know, it's more important that you maintain your relationships and um, remember how important each person is to you as far as that's, that's my outlook of it. You got, and once you figure out what your role is, um, do that to the best of your ability. That, that's what I would say the most important thing about being in a, in a band is, is maintaining your friendships staying in your lane not and, all, and, and also staying in your lane yeah. and, you know and coming you know sometimes you might have to come to terms with that you know like maybe like you're not the person to write the music you're the person to like augment the music in some sort of way or you know you just like throw an idea in and then you get to be like that was my fucking idea well you've mentioned before that you're not the you're not the networker you're not the communicator that's not who i am in the band no i i just i just want to like stay in my lane you know what i mean i want to be with my friends and uh play bass and that's about it you know what i mean i don't i don't particularly want to like make more friends right i don't have time for that but you need that though i mean to market yourselves so you've got to have someone in the band that is we, into it we do yeah. sure well sure. that's what i'm saying is yeah. is um you know it's not your gig it might be somebody else's and you right. guys got that right and you would and and you have to know enough to say hey you should try because that's not your thing. You know, it's not your expertise. That's his. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and sure. then he, and then that same person shouldn't come to you and say you should play like this or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. which is which makes sense. I, and I think that when and you can talk about music, or you can talk about you know even business or whatever. When you've got people trying to cross over and. You know, I know this isn't my job, but, you know, I noticed the way that you've been... Well, why are you right, you're paying attention to my up. shit? You're muddying it up. Pay attention to your shit. Sure, sure. You know. Um, where are you, what are you guys doing right now? Anything uh, in the pipe? We're just getting ready to play that festival in Richmond. Um, we're going to play, like, a little warm-up show uh, on April 2nd, the same day as my shower, oh. and also a fucking WrestleMania, so uh, it's a very busy day. Because I did want to have you back for WrestleMania. I'm sorry. <sighs> I'm sorry. Well, I mean, not on WrestleMania day, maybe the week of. And oh, we can discuss it We can do want. our own little shitty preview. That'd be nice. It would be. Okay. Wow. How are you going to pull that off? Um, the show, Mania, and the shower. The shower, well, you know, they're all separate times. I'll, I'll figure it out figure it out i can watch mania on the, on the network on the network time. always yeah true so we're not coming here for mania then i i don't think so fuck it I tell everybody rock, not to watch and we'll watch it we'll come over to the following sunday that'd be fun that'd maybe be, yeah that'd be cool any bets well we can if we're gonna watch it late right damn i know i love wrestling joe is there anything else that um you know you got the show coming up you got the show here and where, where's your show where's your local show it's at that um it's at this like abandoned church that got turned into like a little DIY spot. Um, 
This is run by this dude, Maxwell. He also lives there. It's like a cool little spot that we... That's where, like, most of the shows take place now. Okay. It's like a DIY, like, ghetto kind of thing. Not where, that it's, like, shitty. Where can we find your albums and merch if we wanted to support um, the we're band? True, we're at True Love Crew on uh, on Twitter, and we have a band camp, and uh, we're signed to Bridge Nine Records. So... Just you can find all that shit there. Find all that The online. record's called uh, Heaven's Too Good For Us. And that's, that's, that, that's that. How does that work? So the stuff that you've had out in other bands, um, if people buy it still, like how do you guys figure all that out? Like what? Well, I mean, you didn't you have, didn't, um, didn't you have any other albums and EPs and stuff come out that you've sold? Like, like other bands? Fight it out? Or, yeah. Louder Than Bombs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had that We had that stuff. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of, like, Fight It Out EPs in my parents' basement if you want to buy one. <laughs> there's no on, there's no online presence for any of them anymore? Um, iTunes or anything? I don't know. I don't fuck with it. Okay. It's not, not my... not Like I said, that's not in my lane. You know what I mean? Because I wonder how that would work if you guys are all... Like, even, like, well, like I bands said, that break up or whatever you know, and they we don't, don't put anything out. None of the other bands have an agreement with anyone else. We mm-hmm. all did everything by ourselves, so... Does it happen? I mean, does anybody say, yo, I want a Louder Than Bombs? Oh, fuck no. Really? Oh. No. No Fight It Out stuff gets sold? There's not no. that nostalgic person out there It's like, I really miss this. I mean, there might be, but they're like, they're not, buying, fuck not enough to spend yeah. it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Joe, thanks for coming on. I appreciate uh, rescheduling and um, making up for the difficulties of the last time. And um, appreciate the time you're giving me. Appreciate you hosting this today. And... Good luck with the tour and good luck with the shows. Thanks. All right. Some really cool stuff from Joe. Listening to his passion for the music, his passion for the genre of hardcore punk. Give them a listen. They they are good. If, if you're not into hardcore punk, they are good. Just to appreciate the hard work and the talent that all these guys have and uh, the passion that they put into it, which is really neat. Um, it's it, I like it. I like them. I don't listen to a whole lot more other than them in uh, hardcore punk, but they are worth a listen. Go find them. You know, Joe told you you can find them at their Twitter handle. You can go to YouTube and search for them, and there's some some video from some of their different shows. And it's a good band. He's really passionate about it. Obviously, you can tell he talked about some of his other bands, but when he did talk about True Love, you can see that this is a, a good project for them. And just appreciate their art and enjoy what they're doing. So... That was the music portion of uh, the Salmena Not Yet Named Gimmick, Gimmick, Gimmick podcast. Uh, we're going to move into a couple things. Listen, I, I started this wanting to really hammer home on sports, and you know we're going to have a couple exciting weeks coming up here, and I will have some people with us to talk about uh, March Madness and wrapping all that up and Michigan's great run that they're making right now. And we got the NFL draft starting up, and... Want to talk tennis? I know maybe we went a little heavy on episode one on tennis, but it's okay. I had a real interesting theory brought up to me about a recent match that Federer won and a fix, but I, I'll have to bring Sean back on for that one. But we're going to switch gears here. My next guest is an award-winning sommelier and a friend of mine. But again, another celebrity for you guys. I'm, I'm doing work. I'm making it happen for everybody. But until then... Thanks for listening. I'll say it again. I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. Subscribe at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher. Leave some really nice comments because you really like me. And even if you think I'm not that great, just lie. Any good comments or any feedback that you guys have for me is much appreciated. I hope you guys have liked what you heard so far. And I hope you guys continue to listen. And until the next time, thanks a lot.